This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Welcome to the Cyber Underground. I'm Dave Stevens, your host. I'm the Cyber Guy, and today we're going to change it up just a little bit. We're still talking about cybersecurity, and we're also going to talk about hacktivists and how they actually get made. Now, that ballistic missile alarm that we got that was a false alarm could have changed our psyche a little bit, and it occurred to me this has been happening in history over and over. To discuss this with me, Tom Moore, adjunct faculty, Kapiolani Community College. Hi, Tom. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. How for are you, me. sir? I'm in pretty good shape for the shape I'm in. So happy <laughs> to be here. Well, I, I love having you on the show. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Just give us a. Well, for the purpose of today, I'm adjunct faculty at Kapiolani <laughs> Community College, just like you. Uh, just teach on a different floor in a different building. It's basically the same audience. So you're you're a local boy, though. Yeah. Uh, depends on how far back. Go. State. I, I sort of grew up in Hilo, and I've been living on Oahu for you know thirty years or so. So just hanging out. Yeah, just just hanging. Waiting out. for this moment. Yeah, <laughs> this is this is my big break. Yeah. All right. I'm expecting everything to be different after today. Everything will be different after today. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about the short-term mentality that's been uh, developed in our culture, and this has happened in other cultures in the past. And you had, you had a great note in here. If you could read us right here, this one that you came up with. I love this. Oh, that one? Yes, that one. Uh, let's just eat the seeds. Why bother to plant them? Right. Since I have no future, there is no future. Yeah. Right. right. Exactly. Yeah. So the, in a lot of cultures, this has come out before. We've seen it in the Greeks. We've seen, in, seen it in the Romans, where it's, it's not only the, the stress of living, but also... When, say, when Rome and Greece started out, they were on highly industrial societies. Um, and that's why they, they flourished, especially Rome. And, and they had what's called deferred gratification. So their investment in time and, 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 and effort right, would pay off at a later time. And we see that in agrarian communities. When we went from the hunter-gatherer to the sure. agricultural communities, we have to plant a seed. And then we got to sit back and wait and nurture the seed because the benefit comes months later. And then you get to harvest, and then there's some gratification. So run through this with the deferred gratification versus its opposite a well, little bit. The opposite's pretty simple. Instant gratification or the ever popular extra instant gratification. Now describe that, extra instant. I would just made it up. I, can't, <laughs> I couldn't possibly describe it. But there, the trend is people are demanding uh, and when I say people, I mean all kinds of people, infants even. They've done studies that itty bitty little babies, given a choice between a cookie now and uh, two cookies later, prefer a cookie now. Yeah. And it's, it's scary because all kinds of good things come from deferred gratification. Right. Success comes from deferred gratification. Civilization comes from deferred gratification. Tools and investment. And absent a sense, ad, absent a value for deferred gratification, and given the, the growth, the, the decline, if you will, into our, our want, perceived need for instant gratification, we're seeing all kinds of unpleasant and unpleasant consequences. It's, it's scary. Yeah. Let's talk about the unpleasant consequences now. So we talked about how Rome and Greece came to power because they were deferred gratification. They, they studied mathematics and engineering and, and agriculture and, uh, and waste management and uh, water management. And uh, they came up with the irrigation techniques that we still use today and the bridge building and the arches that we still use, use today. Their aqueducts in Rome are still standing. It's, it's amazing architecture. So um, on the, at the end of those societies though, when they started to decline, the resources became so bountiful, so plentiful that we actually had, or they actually had, a class of citizenry that no longer had to be part of the industriousness of the society. They could just benefit as consumers. And that uh, they were the patricianers, of course, in Rome. And we have that class of society now here in our culture. And I would say it's almost everybody. 
pretty much. Well, there's, there's hardly anybody that gets into the nitty gritty and works, uh, you know, 12 hours a day building a bridge or, or mining coal, and, and everybody else just gets to walk into their house and turn on the light, and hey, you have light. Turn on the heater, you can heat your house. Turn the air conditioner. Massively, uh, tremendously um, important out here in the islands. You know, I have it in my car. If I didn't have air conditioning in my car, it's 1960 again and I'm suffering. Uh, People don't like suffering. No, we they, don't like suffering. They don't think they can endure it, really. Right. Yeah, which is a little, a little tragic. It is a, a great deal of tragedy um, in that statement, I think, because sometimes suffering builds the character that could in, improve you in the long run. Right? I, would, I would say that almost all suffering does improve you somehow in the long run because it makes you tougher, makes you a better problem solver, and it challenges you to, uh, to be, I think, a better thinker. It, it certainly gives you, it, all that's true. Perhaps another consequence or advantage is that it helps you discern the difference between what you want and what you need. That is a great one. I love that. Yeah, let's connect this now to uh, why we're doing this on the Cyber Underground. And um, I see right now in the, in the cybersecurity field, there's a tremendous amount of patches and fixes coming out, Spectre and Meltdown are some of them. And uh, these have to do with engineers not thinking about security risks. They're thinking only, does it work? And I, you know, you and I have worked in industry for decades, between us half a century probably. And, and uh, many of the times when I was working in the industry, and say I was a programmer, I was making an application, the owners of the business would tell me, hey, just make it work, we gotta sell this thing right now. Hurry up. I, yeah, hurry up. And I'd say, well, it's working, we did a good demo, but I gotta go back and clean it up. I gotta make it secure, I gotta make it stable, I gotta make it extensible. And they'd say, no, no, we don't have time. Do that later. And it never came. No, there is no later. There is no later. There's never a later. So we end up with unsecure, unstable uh, scaffolding that could fall down at the, uh, you know, the little shake of the earth. And we have tons of that software right now. And that's a short-term mentality. So let's talk about in the United States, how did we come to this point? Well, Maybe I, we should go back to the beginning of the United States well, no, versus I now. No, I mean, that, it, Basically, what you know, we both, as it happens, at least for the moment, work in a bureaucracy. And no. Yeah, I, I heard that. <laughs> I, did you not get the memo? I did. It must not have made it to my office. Uh, on the yes. Well, um, <laughs> you know, it's interesting that there's always enough. To, wait a second. Uh, do, 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 do. There's <laughs> never. Here, sorry. <laughs> there's never enough time to do it right, but there's always enough time to do it over. Always. And so what you had alluded to is, you know, with your management, hey, it looks finished, it works in one case under one limited set of circumstances, right. but as a system thinker, you know, as a, as a professional technologist, you want it to work as much as possible in all cases. And, yeah. you know, perhaps that's not economically feasible, all cases, but one case isn't enough. Now, that's a perfect example of this that's just occurred. Intel did release some patches for its Spectre, or, I'm sorry, they're, they're mitigating meltdown. But they uh, initiated patches, and that patch management, when people implemented it, caused computers to randomly reboot. Yes, well, all they needed to do is to get a patch out the door. Uh, they needed a press release. They didn't need a solution. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, they're looking for some PR. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And now their statement is, we'll have a patch out at the end of this year, which if nobody's really paying attention, it's only... January. Yeah. That's a, quite a while away. Well, you, you <laughs> deferred gratification, deferred attention. Uh, yeah, well, maybe they'll make it right. So that's a good, but in the meantime, we're all unsecure, right? This is, this is a bad problem. We are having to mitigate this problem by adjusting other software applications that run on your computer so they are not susceptible uh, to these, uh, these attacks. Um, Spectre Meltdown, Spectre variant one deals with JavaScript and a shared buffer array. And so you have to, upgrade your browser or change settings in a browser to compensate for this. And people love doing that. Ah, and people love doing that, except do when it, it slows the down the computer. Oh, by 30% or so. Yeah. yeah, and so the older processors are really struggling with this, and it all comes down to people wanted to make things faster for more instant gratification. For instance, in the browser, when they used a shared array, which is a storage area for, for anything you want to put in it in memory, 
that was shared across applications and sometimes the application using it wouldn't go in and check the size of the array before it started jamming stuff in there. So jamming stuff in there without checking it first, of course, doubles the speed. So more instant gratification, you can see your browser's faster. But now with this new error, if you don't check that first, another application can share that and speculate what's in that mm -hmm. by some random method. So that's what Spectre is all about. It's speculation of what's in that shared buffer array. Right. Now when you configure that not to work or upgrade your browser in Chrome, Firefox, so forth, uh, it's slowing down your browser. Now for faster processors, you don't feel a thing. Yep. So if you're out there buying new equipment all the time, the instant gratification of better stuff, you're not going to feel the impact. But people who are practicing deferred gratification, you know, my Mac, I want it around for six, seven, eight years, as long as I can get to the new OS, uh, my Mac is slowing down. The longer you can postpone your new purchase, the more bang for your buck you get when you replace it. And yeah, some people yeah. are tied into legacy applications that they can't, you know, they, they're stuck with. You know, their organization doesn't want to replace it, is unwilling oh. and or unable to replace it, state tax department. And, um, <laughs> and they won't retool it to work with newer systems. And I know there are organizations that have to use, say, Internet Explorer 8 because their web application was written for IE8 and no other browser and uses features only in IE8 and IE9 would break it. The national health uh, provider in uh, London, in, in England, oh, you know, yeah, yeah. they're stuck with XP because their apps only work in that environment and they didn't know that they could virtualize it and so, you know, their entire national healthcare system got uh, There's a got ransomware. ransomware. Yeah, yeah and that's why. It, yeah. I, and this is kind of strange and sad at the same time because you know that's not fixed. Oh, hell no. You, you can't go through the entire NHS in UK and say, oh, by the way, you got to upgrade everything. Yeah. And rewrite your entire application. And could you have that done by just afternoon? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's not done. I do not think so. <laughs> that is probably one of the biggest projects they're ever going to have to face, and it's a budget buster, which is, comes down to money. And let's talk about the management aspect of building this kind of stuff and some of the technology companies that pioneered this activity, putting a piece of software out there and letting the consumer deal with it, but they're making money on the short term, so that company's share price goes up and all the executives get a big bonus. They save a lot of money if the customer becomes the beta tester. That's right. Or in the worst case, the alpha tester. Uh, uh, yeah, let's describe this. So when we're releasing a product, there's usually um, a, a very small batch of testers the alpha testers, and they test the very loose edges of something that's no, nowhere near complete. But they, they, they map out the very, uh, the tremendously horrible bugs that might be there. Then they go to a beta test after they've mapped out those big bugs, and the beta testers are a little larger group, but they tend to find a lot more of the nitty gritty in the bugs, and they test more scenarios. So, especially gamers now, this is a big one, beta testing games, uh, that would drive me nuts, but some people make a career out of it, and so I, I like that. And a good living, by And the way. a good living, I might <laughs> add. So, and then we go to your first release, and that release candidate is what gets pushed out to all the people who are on the early release list. Mm -hmm. And again, you're using consumers to test your product. So, you're, you've gone from the engineers to the consumers in four steps, and then you do the real release. Now, Microsoft's gone to this, but they didn't implement that until about the mid-90s. And I remember the first windows that kept coming out and coming out and coming out, and it was tragedy. But they made billions upon billions of dollars. Well, it used to be that you know, th there's this economic concept in internalizing externalities. It used to be that the manufacturers paid for their mistakes because they provided support, uh, free support. Mm. And when they paid for their mistakes, then they had some kind of an incentive to release a quality product. To the extent that the, that the support model and the funding for the support model is, is completely different now. Yeah, completely yeah. different, yeah. Yeah, it's virtually non support is virtually non-existent. Well, it's pushed back to the customer. Exactly. Right? you got to pay for it now. Exactly. So we're going to come back and talk about that. We're taking a one-minute break. We'll be back. Uh, We've got to pay some bills. Until then, stay safe. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands about working together, 
working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. I'm going to the game and it's gonna be great. Early arriving for a little tailgate. I usually drink but won't be drinking today cause I'm the designated driver and that's okay. It's nice to be the guy that keeps his friends in line. Keeps him from drinking too much so he can have a great time. A little responsibility can go a long way cause it's all about having fun on game day. I'm the guy you wanna be. I'm the guy saving money. I'm the guy with the H2O and I'm the guy that says let's go. Welcome back. We're here to the Cyber Underground. Uh, by the way, if you're going to comment on this episode on YouTube, please give a comment about my glasses. I've been hearing a lot about them today. Apparently, when I wear glasses with these frames, I look smarter. I actually heard you look smart first, and then someone said smarter, which I appreciate a Lucky lot. Lucky thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Much more gentle. <laughs> We were talking about uh, kind of the short-term mentality of uh, manufacturing uh, software. And uh, let's talk about how it's developed in, in other products, too, in engineering circles. And, and I'm going to talk about cars because the latest cars coming out now have uh, online capabilities that have already been hacked. People are hacking Jeeps. Uh, sorry, I have to pick on Jeeps. That was the first, right? Uh, and, and you can... You can hack into a car and make it do things. Slam on the brakes, take it off the road, shut off the engine, whatever. Kill people. For, and kill people. For law enforcement, that's a good thing. Uh, everybody else, that's not a good thing. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about the short-term mentality. Now, if I bought a 1955 Ford F-150. A red one? A red, of course, you've got red and black or yeah. something like that. Any color you want, as long Any, as it's red. Right. <laughs> that would probably still be parked outside my house and probably be my go-to vehicle for heavy lifting. It might be your retirement plan. It could, well, yeah, if it was a really <laughs> nice it's one, a, right? It's a, it's a cut design at this point. But it's, it was a good vehicle. Yeah. I mean, it was a solid V8 engine made of solid steel, and if you cared for that thing, it'd be working today. And you'd be a loyal customer into the future. Well, I don't know. I bought Fords for many years, many decades, and I saw the quality decline. Well, but based on that, that first one, you well, would have been a... Yeah. I stayed with Ford based on that first one. Yeah. So I had, the, I had a Ford Falcon. Great, solid, six-cylinder car, got me around, good gas mileage, and I could just beat it to death. And it was, it was a wonderful car, and it was, it was built in the 60s. By the 70s, when I bought my Mustang, things were changing. There was a designed obsolescence on a short-term mentality. People started to finance their vehicles for three, longer, four, five longer years, longer right? Of time. Longer, sure. and longer periods. And so by the 80s, what I saw was the cars I was buying in the 80s, uh, they were only made to last five years. You finish your payment, maybe one or two years later, you gotta buy a new car because that thing's just falling apart. The Dodge Aries K car was a perfect example. That was a disposable can opener that you weren't supposed to fix. And mechanics would actually turn you away. There's, I can't get parts for it. This thing's all one big piece, so I can't... Uni yeah. Unibody. It was Unibody, that's right. One um, of the first ones. Well, we keep doing that. You know, the, the last Ford, I'm gonna pick on Ford now. For Ford Explorer, I had the, the 2004 Ford Ford Explorer. you don't have it anymore? I, no, I tricked somebody into buying it. No, actually, I sold it, and they were very happy to get it. But I did warn them, everything plastic on the vehicle was beginning to become so brittle, it would just disintegrate. So the, the secondary controls on the, on the roof and the dashboard and in the center console, I had to keep replacing those, and it was hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Of course. And every four or five years, those things would just disintegrate. The rubber parts were the same way. Uh, there was a hole where you pulled out the seatbelt. It actually wore a groove in the hole every time I pulled the seatbelt because the seatbelt was tougher than the plastic. So I, I don't think we're actually designing for the longevity anymore. We're designing for profitability, and it's all short term. But there's a, there's a trick to it, you know. It's, these, these aren't just random things. You, you, you've probably heard of big data, right? Sure, you're, you're yeah, and they're data, analyzing right? their data. Yeah, yeah, they're analyzing their data, and so they work these things out. It's very coordinated. You know, they ask the engineers, when's this gonna break? Engineers give them a number. Oh, I don't know, uh, 53 months. Says, are you sure? Yeah, we're pretty sure it's going to probably break. MTBF, meantime between failure, it's going to be 53 months. Call accounting. 
we want a four-year warranty. Yeah, four-year warranty. Yeah, four year warranty. warranty. That's it. Yeah. So forty-eight it, months. Yeah, it's not. Um, it's not random. You know, the, it's it's the perception is it's profitability oriented. But and that's short term again. Exactly. We're, we're looking, as Americans especially, I think, we look six months ahead at the most. I, if, I think it's highly unusual for a company to come out and say, this is where we're going to be next year, and actually be there next year. Because they change their plans so often because of small shifts in the market. So people have become short term thinkers. So when they're writing software, short term. Oh, Internet of Things, perfect example. I just want this webcam to work. Stick it on the wall, hook it up to your Wi-Fi. Security be damned. Oh yeah. I just want it to work. And now those webcams can be used for DDoS attacks and breaking into your Wi-Fi. We have refrigerators that are Wi-Fi enabled with absolutely no security. There's a username and password. Ha ha. Password. <laughs> yes. Didn't you send me the picture of the Hawaii Emergency Management System, the screenshot from the the interview and, the, and this person posing in front of one of the computers inside the control center. Yes, I do recall having sent you that, uh, that, uh, <laughs> that screenshot. And tell me, what was so unusual about it? The post-it note sticking to the screen had the username in the and password in the yeah. background, right? Yeah. It had the administrator password. password. Yes. Yeah. That's why <laughs> Didn't it actually say administrator? I could be. No, it was an maybe admin that was, something. Yeah. <laughs> but I, you know, it's scary, but uh, when I go to audit companies as part of uh, the, the business I operate, the cybersecurity business, we do in, um, audits and, and, and vulnerability assessments, and you'd be surprised how many places someone can put a written password on a, on a post-it. Uh, it could be under the keyboard. It can be hanging on the on the screen. It could be up above. But again, I think this is short-term mentality. No one's taking the time to memorize the password or put it in a place that's actually secure. It's just a quickie and stick it on the monitor. Well, once again, especially in a bureaucracy, people essentially are trying to cover their anatomy. You know, they make rules. You know, they check off boxes on forms that yeah. they go in files that people don't read. And so they have to have a password policy that creates stupid passwords that are hard for people to remember. They change every 30 days. And, and they furthermore change them every, every 30 days. So people, you know, they rebel in their own sort of silent little way. Yeah. And they put them on post of notes and stick them on the screen. And, that's, you a, know, that's a rebellion. Nah, 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 you know, they, people, legions of people aren't going to do things the hard way unless you really make them do you it. you got to force so, them. Yeah, and that's too expensive. Let's, let's connect that now to things like hacktivism. And there's a connection here. Let's talk about... Uh, where activism meets hacktivism, and now if you don't know hacktivists, uh, you know hacktivists are uh, people with a political cause or an agenda, and they're not really out for the profitability. Or, they or want philosophical. To could, or could, philosophical. Could be, could be yeah, it could be uh, ideological. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. They want to push their agenda somehow, so they use hacking techniques to get it done. They hack a website, they put up their message or their, their manifesto or something. Denial of service attack, you know. And they can bring down a company, right? But they can also cause harm. Now, uh, hacking doesn't have to be just affecting computer systems that just inconveniences people. I'll give you an example. Last time we went to uh, Black Hat, we saw a demonstration of somebody that hacked into a car wash and controlled the in industrial control system via a web app that was provided by the industrial control system and wasn't secure yeah. because they didn't bother. And they were able to close the car wash door on top of a car over and over and over until they really damaged the car. It must have been fun because they obviously had a, a webcam so they could see it happening and this probably had a... They, there was a webcam in the car wash that yeah. was connected to the application. Yeah, so yeah, they can watch and laugh. Hilarious and, fun. And that could be connected to hacktivism if somebody was environmentally uh, sure. conscious and they said hey, the soaps bad. you're using yeah. and it's getting oil into the gutter system which goes right to the ocean. You yeah. know, there's, there's a lot of uh, hacktivism that could occur and that's one of the connections we can make. They can hurt people with the hacktivists, but their mentality is, I don't have to pay for that because there is no tomorrow. I'm not gonna get caught because in a couple of years when they figure it out, I'll be dead. And the there's, no, will be. there's no relationship. You know, people live between their thumbs. You know, <laughs> they, there's, they don't, there's a lot more self-absorption than there used to be. Mm. There, there's, you know, selflessness is, you know, some people go, what? Selflessness, is that a word? What is that? Selflessness. Um, but, you know, what if you've got a pacemaker? 
and someone goes, you know, some pimply faced teenager goes, hey, let's hack pacemakers. Yeah. What could possibly go wrong, oh, wrong, yeah. wrong? And pacemakers have already been hacked. Exactly. Yeah. The latest thing is now you can get a um, contact lens that will read your um, will read your diabetes level, your, your blood sugar level, which very soon, if not already, will be connected to a pump that pumps insulin into your body. Oh, so and if it's hacked, you get the wrong dosage and you could die. Yeah. Right. Ta-da! Yeah. Better living through... <laughs> yeah. yeah, chemicals was the old one, right? Well, better yeah, living better chemicals. living through technology. <laughs> and if people don't give a darn, if people don't have empathy for other human beings... They want to be than, first to market. Yep. Yeah. That's, that's the important part. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and I think our, our medical providers are uh, right at the forefront of putting IoT devices on wireless that, that aren't secure. Um, pacemakers, uh, even morphine can be on a Wi-Fi. So They've got intracranial die. pumps now. You can put just a tiny little bit of stuff in, you know, for mental illness and... It, uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy. That's it's scary. Well, it, it's the double-edged sword thing, right? I mean, for every cool thing that's, that's powerful, it becomes more, if, to the extent that it's more and more good, um, has more and more power for good, automatically it has more and more power for evil. It's true, there's a balance to that. Yeah. Well, let's talk about how people, I think, in the United States, in our culture, might have uh, developed this kind of mentality, say, over the last 70 years. I'm thinking uh, post-World War II, um, 1950s were in our heyday. And then we go into something called the Cold War, when we realize Russia has the atomic bomb. Then we have intercontinental ballistic missiles. And all the way up until you know, the 70s and 80s, when I'm growing up, 70s and 80s, um, we're still having the duck and cover drills, but then they became earthquake drills in, in California. It's the same drill. Yeah, yeah, get yeah. under the table and, yeah. and pray. Did you get the mutually assur assured destruction memo? Yes. Yeah, that was the plan. Yeah, it's wonderful. We don't me. care if we survive so long as they're all dead. Right. And both guys have that mentality, and it's like, why should I clean the bathroom? Well, now we have North Korea, and we have the ballistic missile alert, and it just it promotes a philosophy of... Why should I really care? Never mind. It just doesn't matter because we're all going to die tomorrow. Well, unless the ice caps all melt and we're, you know, blub, blub, blub. You know, there's lots of things to worry oh, about. Oh, climate change. Yeah, sure. Well, with our last 30 seconds, give me your opinion. Did the short-term mentality contribute to things like the Cultural Revolution in the 60s and the weirdness in the 80s and now the, the apathy of the new millennium? I don't remember. Um, <laughs> the 60s were good to you. Yeah, man. yeah. All right. <laughs> I had the same thoughts about the 70s. Yeah. Well, I, I think this uh, science denial goes along with it, too. And people don't want to make the effort to learn the science, so they can't argue science, so they just say it's not real. Well, I can't be wrong if everything is untrue. That's right. Okay, we're going to have to wrap it up. Uh, I, this is a great topic. We should do this again really soon. Would you come time. back? Oh, absolutely. Let's do this again. I'll come back today. <laughs> this afternoon. Yeah. Let's... Well, we'll be doing a promo, too, in a couple of minutes, they tell me. Uh, thanks for joining us on the Cyber Underground. Until next week, stay safe.